Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for a leadership development session tonight. I pray that the Lord himself will speak to every heart and everything we ought to be, everything we ought to do. The Lord will grant us the grace to be and to do in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for the time we spend in your presence. Thank you, Lord, because you have brought us together for a good purpose. And we're asking, Lord, that your word will remind us again the calling you have given us and the pattern we ought to be and the good work, the great work we ought to do to the glory of your name. Help us, Lord, to have real impact and fruitful, purposeful influence upon the ministry in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight, as you can see, we are talking about the divinely revealed pattern for godly ministers. We're coming to Titus chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 7. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. And then it goes on in verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, not having or having no evil to say of you. In verse 9, it comes to our responsibility to exhort servants to be obedient to their masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. In verse 10, it talks about not following him, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. I want you to look at that verse 7 very well. As Paul, the apostle, by the Spirit of God, is speaking to Titus and speaking to the minister, speaking to the pastor, and speaking to the leader of the church. You remember that Titus had been appointed by Paul the Apostle to take charge and to oversee and to lift up the work and to strengthen the work, not only in one local church, but in a province, the province of Crete. And now he's telling Titus, in all things showing thyself, a pattern, a pattern of good works. Underline that word, thyself, thyself. This passage peculiarly and particularly is talking to the minister, is talking to the leader, is talking to a shepherd who has an oversight over the people of God, over the ministry, over the work of the Lord, in all things showing thyself. And now he's telling the minister, he says, you will show yourself a pattern. You show yourself to be an example. You show yourself to be a model. That means then the Lord is talking to you and talking to me directly as a minister, as a leader, a leader over the whole church in a nation, over the whole church in a state, over the whole church in a uh, a region over the whole church in a particular section perhaps like the campus like the children like the youth is talking to the leader and is talking to the leader too over every section of the work and he says we must be you must be in particular a pattern you must be an example you must be a model that is everything we're teaching everything we're learning you ought to be at the forefront, not just talking, you know, but demonstrating and manifesting the truthfulness of everything you know, we learn. And it says a pattern of good works. And now he comes to the details and he says, number one, in doctrine, 
you are showing you know, uncorruptness, incorruptibility. And you're showing gravity. Your words must be witchy. Your life must be witchy. You must not be a light-hearted person. You must not be a light a person that has no weight, that has no authority. There must be gravity. And then it says sincerity that cuts off all hypocrisy, that cuts off all eye service. It must be from the depths of the heart. And now he tells us in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, our speech must be sound. It says our communication must be sound. Our conversation interacting one with the other, whether in the private or in the public, it must be sound. And it says the word, the conversation, the speech that cannot be condemned, that when anybody looks at this, anything you see, and everything you are seeing, either in the family circle or it is in the public circle, it says that word will be a pattern, will be a model, your conversation, your lifestyle will be such an example that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part, even those who don't believe in what you believe in, will be ashamed having no evil sin to say of you. There's another thing we're looking at before we get into the study proper, and I want you to notice in verse 7. In verse 7 it says, in all things, it says now that there's no area of life, there's no area of a character, and there's no area of a ministry that will be left out in your example, in your model, and in your pattern. It says in all things. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us that we must not have any evil sin to say about us. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it says, exhorting servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well, underline these words again, in all things. You see, the life of the minister is a challenging life. The life of the minister, the family life, the professional life, the pastoral life, the ministerial life, every part of the life of the minister is very important. And it says we must not allow, you know, some parts to be well done and then the other part is so flabby and we're excusing a lot of things. It says in our lives, it says in our ministries, it says in our families, it says in the, in the comportment of every area of our lives, it must be in all things we're doing well and we're pleasing the Lord well. It tells us in verse 10, the last three words there, in all things. The first three words in verse 7, in all things. The last three words in verse 10, in all things. It says everything. It says then, as we look at the study today, and we look at the pattern, the Lord is setting before us. It says, this is what the leader this is what the minister and this is what the pastor is called to do. The word of God today, the divinely revealed pattern for godly ministers. The divinely revealed pattern for godly ministers. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 8. Our reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8, we're looking at verse 5. It tells us, it says, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, says he, that thou make all things, look at that, that thou make all things according to the pattern, that's the word, according to the pattern should be in the mount. Moses was not allowed to use his own native intelligence. He was not allowed to use human wisdom. He was not allowed to use anything that he would have said, well, I don't have to ask God about this. I think I know enough to do this myself. He was to show himself as a good pattern. And the pattern had been shown to him 
in the mount. If that was true in the old covenant, I but the new covenant, look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, but now as he obtained a more excellent ministry, more excellent ministry than the old covenant ministry, more excellent ministry than the old testament. And it says, but now Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises in a better ministry excellent ministry based on better promises in this better covenant where to pattern everything in life everything in ministry everything that we do were to pattern everything on the word of God and there is nothing to be let out at all. We're dividing the message today to three parts. Number one, the pastoral pattern of godliness for every shepherd. Number two, the prescribed pattern of holiness for his servants. Point number three now, the principal pattern of righteousness all saints. Let's come to number one. Number one, the pastoral pattern of godliness for every shepherd. We're coming to uh, Titus chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 7. Titus chapter 2, we're looking at verse 7. In all things, showing itself a pattern of good works. In all things, Titus, in all things, Timothy, in all things, Silas, in all things, pastor there, in all things, overseer there, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. There, there are three things we're considering here. Number one is the question. Number two is the qualification. Number three is the qualifier. Number one, an inescapable question. The question is, are we the pattern? We ought to be pattern in everything. The inescapable question. Number two, the inalterable qualification. The Lord has already shown us in, in this epistle to Titus the qualification that a minister ought to have. And now Paul is bringing, by the Spirit of God, is bringing Titus to the very point. And he wants to know if you're going to be selecting other people, choosing other people, are you qualified yourself? And it's an inalterable qualification. Number three is the impactful qualifier. Titus was to be a qualifier. It was to be choosing people and qualifying them and showing them the way of grace. And he was to lead as a pattern himself. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Number one, the inescapable question on godliness in all things. The inescapable question on godliness in all things. And let's look at that again. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Titus, you cannot tell people to run if you are not running. You cannot tell people to preach if you are not preaching. You cannot tell other people to be steadfast if you are sluggish. You cannot tell other people to do good works if you yourself, if you are empty of good works. Titus, preacher, pastor, overseer, minister, leader, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Look at the question we're looking at. We're looking at uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 42. Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 42. Here is the question, either how canst thou say to thy brother, to the people who are under your leadership, brother or sister, let me pull out the boat that is in thine eye. When thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye, 
How can we correct other people, challenge other people? How can we put other people in the right direction of the qualification of leadership, of the strength of leadership, the courage of leadership, and of the commitment to leadership if we ourselves, if we're not able to do that? You tell others to run, but you cannot run. You tell others to be up and doing, but you cannot be up and doing. You tell other people to be committed, and you cannot be committed. Christ said, thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the moat that is in thy brother's eye. It tells us in Romans chapter 2, we're reading there from verse 19. Romans chapter 2, we're reading from verse 19. A great question, an important question, and that thou and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind and a light of them which are in darkness now in verse 20 in verse 20 it says you say you're an instructor of the foolish a teacher of the babes which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Here comes the question now. In verse 21, in verse 21, thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? How can you challenge other people to follow a pattern when you are not laying the pattern for them? How can you challenge other people to stand straight doctrinally? incorruptible doctrinally and grave witchy and yet you are not witty you yourself you are very light how can you tell other people to be sincere and to do the work in all faithfulness transparently holy and transparently righteous transparently sincere and you yourself if you are not like that that's why the question is coming thou therefore with teachers another teachers not thou thyself Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? We must lay the pattern. We must show the pattern to other people. What pattern are we showing to other people? Let's go to number two now. The inalterable qualification and godliness of all teachers. We're going to teach. We're going to preach. We're going to counsel. We're going to help other people to be what they ought to be. We ourselves must show that we have the quality. And look at uh, Titus chapter 1. We're looking at verse 5. Titus chapter 1. We're looking at verse 5. Here Paul, the apostle, is talking to Titus. And he says, for this cause, let I thee increase that thou should I search in order the things that are wanting and to ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Hold on for a moment. You see this instruction, Titus, you are to appoint elders, you are to appoint pastors, you are to appoint preachers, shepherds over the local congregations. But understand, if you cannot select qualified teachers and qualified preachers and qualified ministers, those ministers that you appoint on those local churches, how can you, ex how can you expect of them to choose qualified ushers, qualified singers, and qualified workers in that local church? You show the pattern yourself that titles or preacher or overseer over the state, overseer over the nation, overseer over the region, the choices you make, the appointments you make, you make them according to qualification. That will be an example, that will be a pattern, and that will be a model that other leaders that you have chosen, when they are going to appoint other people to you, they appoint qualified people. Look at verse 6 now, the qualification that we are to fulfill as ministers. If any man be blameless, look at that. The very first thing it says, that titles in your appointment. The people you appoint, it must be without blame. It's not that, you know, we sweep all their blemishes under the carpet. 
where they, they will sweep all their uh, deficiencies under the carpet and will sweep all their idiosyncrasies and evil things under the carpet and just say, well, you know, to encourage everybody, everybody needs encouragement now and everybody needs, uh, you know, support now. We know he's not qualified by and by. He will see what to correct. It says titles, leader, overseer. You choose the people who are capable. You choose the people who are competent. You choose the people that do not have obvious blame, obvious blemish before the people that they will say, look at the person they gave us. Look at the pastor they gave us. Look at the leader they gave us in our section. Look at this one. Every step he takes is full of blame. It says, if any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, and then in verse 7, it says in verse 7, for a bishop, don't allow that word to, you know, put you off. It just means an elder. It just means, because he said, I said you should appoint elders in every city. Those elders are now referred to as bishop. It's just a leader. For a leader, for a pastor, for a shepherd, must be blameless, must, must, must be blameless. There is the qualification, and we cannot alter the qualification. It must be blameless as a steward of God, as a steward of God, not of man, not men, pleasers, the people who are conscious of God in everything they do, not self-willed, not so angry, not given to wine, an indulgent person that, you know, he cannot do without this. He must please the flesh and is no striker. It's not somebody who is fighting. It's not somebody who is quarrelsome. Not given to filthy looker. And then in verse 8, it says, but a lover of hospitality. You want to be around him. You want to be around her. A lover of hospitality. A lover of good men. So Sober, just, holy, and temperate. And then it says in verse 9, this is the person that is holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Not somebody who is going to bring in false doctrine, erroneous doctrine. Is uh, you know, seeing something uh, interesting on the YouTube and whether the thing is right or not. Apart from me just uh, privately, uh, you know, looking into that, which is bad enough. He wants to introduce it to all the members of the church. Such a person is not qualified to be a leader over the people of God. Is not a pattern. Is not an example. And is not a model. A person who is going to have the qualification will be somebody holding fast, holding fully and holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught and that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's the qualification and the qualification is so important and we need to abide with that. Of course, we know that already. And the Lord is telling us, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. You see, Paul, the apostle, as he told the Titus, that Titus should be a model, should be an example. Look at himself. He says, ye are witnesses, all the members of the church that looked at his life, and all the various pastors and leaders that he had selected and chosen, like Titus, like Timothy, like Silas, like Luke, like all those people. He said, all of you in Thessalonica, your weaknesses and God also. Look at this, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. That's a pattern. Your witnesses, not no part of our life is hidden, and there's nothing uh, behind the door that we have done or doing uh, that you know you are not witnesses to. And God also is a witness how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Then in verse 11, it says in verse 11. As you know, you know this, you are not ignorant. As you know how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you, my brother. We don't have any confidence, any courage. We don't have the right to charge anyone and to exalt anyone. 
if we are not living by the word we are giving to the people. Our lives must be above board. Our ministry must be above blame. And everything we do must be a pattern and must be a model for the people. That's why we're ministers. That's why we're shepherds to go before in front of the sheep. It says, as she know, how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And now in verse 12, it says in verse 12 that he will walk worthy of God. That he would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and uh, glory. But to show very good example at all times, an example of godliness. Now the impactful qualifier in godliness for all tasks. All the tasks we have in the church and the tasks are many. We need to look for people who are qualified and people who are serious and people who are faithful and people who are committed. The people we can vouch for, the people we can stand for, that we don't have to be looking over their shoulders. They will do the right thing. They will say the right thing. They will go the right direction. They'll have the right impact and the right influence on people. And we impact them after choosing them after selecting them, after appointing them, we make sure that our influence on them impacts them in godliness, whatever their task may be. And let's come back to Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 7. In Titus chapter 2, verse 7, it says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Are you conscious of that as a leader every time? As a leader, as a father every time before your children? As a mother every time before your children? As a wife every time before the neighbors? As a husband every time among those who are walking around doing the home? And as a preacher, as a counselor, everything that you do as a leader, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. It tells us uh, that you must be an impactful qualifier. Look at chapter 1, verse 5, beginning of Titus. Titus chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 5. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For this cause... For this purpose, for this reason, I let thee in Crete. Titus, don't forget, you're not there by yourself. You're not there to you just waste time and waste life. You're not there just to, you know, be at ease. You're not on holiday. You're not on vacation. I left you there in Crete for a reason and for a purpose. Get up and do it and fulfill that purpose. What's the purpose? What's the cause? And what's the reason that thou shouldest search in order the things that are wanting, the things that are lacking? Hold on for a moment. And you know, leadership is a challenging task. Leadership is a task that goes beyond uh, somebody looking for an easy life, an easy existence, and he wants to make friends of all people, the people who are lazy, the people who are idle, the people who are unintelligent, the people who are ignorant, the people who do not know the wherewithal of the work they ought to be, of the work they ought to do. He wants a, a leader that wants to be friendly with everybody. He's not going to set in order the things that are lacking. If I correct that area, they are not like me, and I want them to like me. I'm hungry for friendship. I'm hungry for fellowship. I'm hungry for flattery. And if I get this done, get this done, they will not understand. I will not have friends. You're not there to look for friends. It says that thou shouldest, you must search in order the things that are wanting, the things that are lacking, and ordain, and ordain 
That word carries authority. You put them there. Of course, you are checking up. You're not allowing a Jezebel to just put herself there. You're not allowing an Ahab to put himself there. You're not allowing polygamous Solomon to put himself there. You're not allowing anyone that is uh, just seeking for position to put himself or herself there. You ordain, you appoint elders in every city, every city. That's it. Titus was to choose the people and qualify the people as I had appointed thee. And then it goes on to tell us in chapter 2, chapter 2 of Titus, reading from verse 1. In verse 1 of chapter 2, here is what it says, still talking to Titus, what Titus ought to be and what Titus ought to do. And here it says in chapter 2, verse 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You know, the life of a leader is not the life of jesting. The leader is not saying, uh, well, we're not on the pulpit now. We're not preaching now. And so we can, we can joke, we can jest, and we can, you know, just have a free life and a careless life. It says, Titus, you must be a pattern. The people who did not hear very well when you were preaching, when they look at you in the ordinary life, they will see the message reflected in your life so that wherever you are and whatever you are doing, the quality of leadership and the quality of the life of the ministry of the speech of leadership must always remain there. It says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. In your family, the things that become sound doctrine. And there are people that will say, well, this is family now. And if I tell my wife the real truth, the absolute truth, I know my wife has, uh, you know, a challenge on this, uh, you know, high blood pressure, and she cannot manage information. And therefore, I must hide this from her. I must hide this from her. And when and if she happens to know, and I need to tell her, I must see how to tailor and doctor what I say, that eventually becomes a lie, that you have to lie to the woman and you give the excuse because she has health challenge and she cannot handle the truth. It says, but speak thou the things that become, that befit sound doctrine. Any, anywhere you are as a leader, whether the truth is going to, whether they can handle it or not, if you have to talk to anyone, your speech, and your action, everything must be according you know, to sound doctrine. And look at uh, verse 15 uh, of that Titus chapter 2. In verse 15 it says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. It's not talking about having a domineering attitude there. It just saying that let your word carry authority. Let your life carry authority. Let your disposition carry authority. Let your character carry authority. Let your speech carry authority. These things speak and exhort and rebuke. That just means correct. If something has to be corrected, you correct but not in anger. You're correct, but not with malice, and you're correct, but not with threatening. That's what carries authority. If they know that you always flare up, you always get angry in little sin, and then you are provoked and you are talking in an irrational manner, that one does not carry authority. They say, you know, he has come. We have to be gentle because otherwise he'll boil over and destroy himself. He wants us to have the dignity of leadership, the power of leadership, the authority of leadership, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Hey, you are not going about and saying, honor me, exalt me, respect me. I'm the leader here. I'm the pastor here. It, it just says that your character it will, so, will be so demonstrated that no man will despise you. They will say it's an example. 
is a model. It talks of being at peace with all men. It's a model. It talks about having purity in private and in the public. He's a model. It talks about, uh, you know, spending money in a normal way, scriptural way, and it's not wasteful, and it's not, you know, pilfering. It's not touching the church's money. It's an example. No man will despise him because he is an example. It's not talking about carrying a big stick and going about out and you know I'm going to set everything in order it's not talking about that it's talking about your character and your conduct and your lifestyle and your knowledge as well and your devotion as well that will command respect and no man will despise you we're coming to point number two now point number two is the prescribed pattern of holiness for his servants. We're coming to Titus chapter 2, we're reading verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. And then in verse 8, it says in verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Number one, the incorruptible doctrine of holiness from consecrated pastors. Consecrated pastors. Uh, look at that verse 7 again. It says in verse 7, in all things, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and showing yourself a pattern of good preaching in doctrine. You're showing uncorruptness in doctrine. You show gravity in doctrine. You show sincerity. You are not corrupting the word of God. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. It says in verse 17, there Paul the apostle making himself a pattern, making himself a model. It says, For we are not as many. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. If a person is going to show incorruptibility in doctrine, his life has to be upright. If a leader is going to show incorruptibility in doctrine, his life, her life has to be beyond blame. If somebody has a family problem and somebody is unfaithful in the family and the wife knows the man is unfaithful, when he comes to the word of God and he has to read a part of the word of God that says that we must be husbands of one wife and that we must be pure and holy, there must be no defilement, it will corrupt the interpretation of that verse because of guilt and because of condemnation. He cannot interpret it well, he cannot apply it well because if he does, he'll be thinking at the back of his mind, if I say the way it should be said, that will condemn me and my wife is there. If somebody is not living right and he has bad, evil, filthy relationship with a lady in the church, when he comes to the word of God, he'll be compelled by his action to corrupt the word of God, that lady is there. Because if he speaks the right thing, that lady will say, ah, but that's what they were doing together. How can he come now and say, so that thing was wrong? I didn't know it was wrong. I was ignorant and he led me into this. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity. But as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. It says the minister should be conscious every time we're in the sight of God and we speak in Christ. That ought to be the life and the attitude of a real child of God. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Meditate upon these things. These are the things we we'll meditate on. 
We don't meditate on how I'm going to, you know, deal with that person, deal with that other fellow. We should be above that now. Now that we're coming to the ministry and now that we're leaders in the church of the living God, here is what to meditate on. I'm supposed to be a pattern of good works. I'm supposed to be incorruptible in doctrine. I'm supposed to be grave and weighty and serious and to be taken serious by my congregation. I'm supposed to have all sincerity and meditating on that every time. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy to them that thy profiting may appear to all, that thy progress may appear unto all, that thy profitability and productivity may appear unto all, that shall pursue after godliness, after righteousness, and after fruitfulness may appear unto all. And then he says in verse 16, in verse 16, take heed unto thyself. That's the number one area of concern in a minister's life. Take heed unto thyself. What will I say that will contradict my ministry? What will I say? How will I act that will negate my emphasis in the doctrine of the word of God? Take heed unto thyself. How do I relate with my wife that will contradict what I preach and what I profess according to the word of God? How do I relate to my husband that will contradict what I teach other women in the church? How do I relate with my children? How do I relate with the youths that will contradict what we're emphasizing? How the children of God and the youths in particular should live their lives. You take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save, first of all, thyself, Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. When you talk of repentance, the people who know you and hear you, they'll take that word serious, they'll take it to heart, and then they'll repent, they'll be saved. When you talk of restitution, they'll take it to heart, they'll say, yes, even the pastor, if he mistakenly does anything, and then he comes to the church, he says, I'm sorry for this, they should not have been they'll take you serious. When you talk on holiness and sanctification, if they see that you are taking it to yourself and that your life is holy, pure, and sanctified, they'll take you serious. And those who hear you, they will follow the word as well because you are taking heed unto the doctrine so that you'll save yourself and them that hear you. We're coming to the second section there, and it's the incontestable dedication to holiness by convicting of preachers. You are dedicated to holiness yourself. You believe it, not just because you know I'm in deeper life. You will believe in holiness and this is not time to preach. You believe it with the depth of your heart. And you know that not because of church, not because of anybody's supervision, this is what you believe in your innermost being. And because you are convinced preacher, you'll be a convicting preacher. And because you are practicing preacher, you'll be a pungent and effective minister as well. Incontestable dedication. Look at that Titus chapter 2 reading from the first part of verse 8. In the first part of verse 8, it tells us sound speech that cannot be condemned, incontestable, indisputable, unarguable. Nobody will be able to argue with you because they know that this is what you believe. It's the word of God and you believe it and you're practicing it and you're living by holiness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, looking at verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 2. It says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking craftily. No craft, no pretense, no hypocrisy, no, no handling the word of God deceitfully. 
nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Your conscience is not condemning your heart, preacher. That's not sincere. That's not truthful. That's not transparent. You know what to say on that verse. You are avoiding the truth. You are crafty. You are handling the word of God deceitfully. You are taking the precious commodity and this great gift that came from heaven that has the power to turn lives around. You are playing with that. You are gambling with the souls of men. That accusation will not be against you from your conscience because you are not handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's the way we ought to be. And if we're going to be like that, we must be committed to perfecting everything that is lacking in our own personal lives and perfecting whatever is lacking in the lives of the people that look up to us whom we are leading. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. In verse 10, it says concerning Paul the Apostle, it says, Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face. Praying night and day and exceedingly praying, earnestly praying, fervently praying that we might see your face. To start with, Paul the Apostle was not so much afraid, never, not even afraid in any way of seeing the congregation, of getting in touch with the congregation. It's not a you know, kind of shielding himself from the congregation. Night and day were praying exceedingly and fervently and passionately that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith and my perfect that which is lacking in your faith you see that's what a pastor wants to do that's what a group pastor wants to do you're hearing in many of the states the lockdown is being relaxed so that churches can now open religious uh, houses can now open and the, the, the scene is being relaxed so that even the students, they'll find a way step by step of coming back, coming back to school. What if as we are now allowed to come back, although we observe all that we need to observe, the sanitization of our hands, cleansing our hands, and the temperature, looking at the temperature, and then, uh, you know, the, the face mask, uh, putting that on, uh, and observing everything to make sure that the lives of our members are secured and saved and we keep healthy. What if, uh, you know, a pastor in the local district will say, uh, you know, we're not interested now. Why are they relaxing the, uh, you know, the conditions? And they don't, they're not passionate in wanting to see their members. And then in the group, what if the group pastor will say, well, at this time now, in fact, I'm enjoying this vacation. I'm enjoying this uh, holiday. I'm enjoying this time of, you know, there's no activity now. You mean that? I didn't know there was no activity. But you see, Paul, the apostle said, I'm so eager and I'm so passionate about this that we might come to you and see your face and perfect that which is lacking in your faith. I pray God will help us, will be up and doing in Jesus' name. But you know, if we're going to be eager to perfect what is lacking in the faith of other people, ourselves too, we must perfect that which is lacking in our own faith. Look at verse 8. 11. In verse 11, it says, Now God Himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. It says, One direction we're facing now, we want to get to the congregation, want to get to the people of God, and the most important thing, the urgent thing, the priority of our life is to perfect what is lacking in their faith. And we're praying, God will direct us, Christ will direct us, will direct 
direct her way unto you. In verse 12, it says in verse 12, and the Lord make you increase as we bound together, as we bunch together in fellowship, and then we resume and walk the way it ought to be done. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. Hold on. When we show that love as ministers, when we are patterns of that love, we're models of that love, and we are examples of that love to every part of the congregation, and every part of the congregation also responding to that love, and they can see that between the leader and the members. Between them two is what the children see of daddy and mommy that they too will practice. They will not practice hatred when they see love here between daddy and mommy. The same thing you know, from the shepherd to the, to the congregation to the flock. When they see that love and we're passionate about helping you know, the congregation, lifting up the congregation, encouraging the congregation, giving sound doctrine you know, to the congregation, showing uh, practical Heaven want love to the congregation. They too will increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, To the end of the purpose, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. The minister has to show that pattern first, unblameable in holiness before God. And then uh, the congregation, every member of the congregation will be able to see if our pastor has the grace, if our mother and the Lord has the grace, and if all our leaders, if they have the grace to have this unblameable holiness in the sight of God, the same grace available to them is also available for us. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And let's look at number three now. That's the inconsequential denial of holiness by contradictory it tells us in Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, the second part, it says, if we are models, if we are examples, and if we are doing what we ought to do, and we are who we ought to be, sound speed that cannot be condemned, it says that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil sin to say of you. And what he's saying is, if you are, let's say you're still a professional and you're working in a particular company, in a particular government office, and you occupy a very good position, and the government decides they're going to audit your account, and they audit everything, and they say you have clearance 100%. As we read in the papers of even Nigerians, we don't know whether they're even born again or not, that this individual far away in America, they checked all the books and they saw that in his professional work, as they checked up everything, you know, even though many people say negative things about Nigerians, they said this one is perfect, this one is 100%. If we can have that in the world, I about in the church of the living God, that all the people that will contradict you, they really will not have anything cogent, anything serious to say against you. They have no evil sin to say of you. That's the way we ought to live our lives. Whatever happened in the past 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that one is gone. We're talking about the grace of God in your life at this present time now, after you have been forgiven, after you have been cleansed, and now you stand on a new ground to follow the Lord and to be a model, to be a pattern in the sight of God for the children of God. The denial of holiness by contradictory priests will be inconsequential Sequential. It will not matter at all because you are living the life that you ought to live in. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12. 
First Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, First Peter chapter 2, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles in your place of work, in the market, in your community, in the bus, in the taxi, anywhere you find yourself having your manner of life honest and holy and according to the word of God, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas, whereas they speak against you as evil doers, not because you're an evil doer, and they just say, they just bracket everybody to you, they say, you know, holy, holy people, and they speak evil against you, they say, holier than thou people, they speak evil against you, they say, all those pretenders, and they carry the Bible, and they just talk generally, but when it comes to you, whereas they speak evil of you in the plural, as evil doers, they may by your good works when they get to you and examine your life, all their denial of holiness when applied to you will be inconsequential because it says they shall behold their glorified God in the day of visitation. It tells us in verse 15, in verse 15 it says, for so is the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men with well doing uh, there may be persecution we've learned that uh, recently and there may be opposition we've learned that already in our Christian lives that yet although they speak evil against you and you may suffer but because you're a real child of God and you are standing on the word of God in righteousness, in holiness, and in purity, and you live your life because you know you are answerable and responsible to God. You keep on in well doing whatever the trial, whatever the persecution, and whatever the difficulty, and whatever the challenges, this is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. That's our calling and the grace of God is available and the Lord is telling me and the Lord is telling you that my grace is sufficient for you. You'll find his grace sufficient in your life and in your calling and your ministry in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the principal pattern of righteousness for all saints. We're looking at Titus chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 9. Titus chapter 2, verse 9, exhort servants, hold on, Titus, take care of verses 7 and 8, be a pattern of good works, incorruptible, standing, holy, righteous, and you're a model. After you've taken care of your responsibility and your calling, in verses 7 and 8, now you carry on the ministry of exhortation. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Then it says in verse 10, in verse 10, not for loining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn, that they may beautify, that they may glorify, that they may make acceptable the doctrine of God our Savior. Notice this last three words again in all things, the principal pattern of righteousness. For all saints, it's not talking about the saints of God, the children of God, the believers, the members of the church who are walking in the marketplace, who are walking in offices, who are civil servants, who are walking in companies, who are walking on the road, who are walking in the industries, and you saying those workers, they come to the church and pastor, preacher, leader, 
you must exhort them and you must show them how they are to live in their places of work. Three things. Number one, profitable exhortation to scriptural obedience. Notice this in all six. Profitable exhortation to scriptural obedience in all things. It tells us in that title, chapter 2, verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well, not to please themselves, to please those masters well, to please their employers well in all things. Not selective obedience, not partial obedience, not occasional obedience, not qualified obedience, prompt obedience, proper obedience, good obedience, and entire obedience in all things and not answering again. Tell the people who say they are children of God, they are not satanically bold. And they are not worldly bold. You know, the people of the world, they say they are bold, and they'll answer their masters, their employers again, and they can be rude to their impolite, to their employers. It says, teach those servants. Teach those civil servants and teach those employed servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering. Again, it tells us in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 22. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, servants obey in all things. Look at that. You know, the, the masters of those days, many of them were not Christians. Many of them were not born again. They were forward people. They were difficult people. They were harsh people. And yet the word of God says you are employed in that place as a civil servant. Beautify, adorn the doctrine of Christ. Servants, civil servants, employed servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. In singleness of heart, fearing God. He wants us to be obedient as we carry out the word of the Lord and as we carry out the will of God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it's, we're reading from verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 17. In verse 17, it says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, at us Christians, at us believers, to judge and to evaluate our attitude in the house of God, our action in the place of work, and all our behavior, our character in the home, and everywhere we find ourselves, it says judgment will come, and the Lord is going to look at how we have conducted and comported ourselves, how we have conducted our own lives. You see, if we look at the, at the member of the church, a member of the church, if he's a man, he might be a husband. How has he conducted himself as a husband? He might be a father. How has he conducted himself as a, as a father? And he might be an employee, employed somewhere. How has he conducted himself in the place of employment? He might be an employer himself, the same man. How has he conducted himself as an employer? He might be a community person, a neighbor. How has he conducted himself as a neighbor? The Lord is going to look at every area of the life of the minister as well as of the member. The member may be a woman, may be a sister. How has she conducted herself as a single lady? How has she conducted herself as a mother, as a wife? as an employee, or maybe she's a leader in the secular world, how was she conducted herself? 
the judgment will start, will begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, at us ministers, at us professing members of the church of the living God, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? In verse 18, it says in verse 18, and if the righteous castly be saved, almost lost but saved, and is saved so as by fire, if the righteous castly be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You understand that? The ungodly and the sinner, who is that? Is a so-called member of the church. When he comes to church for those two hours, three hours, he appears godly and he appears, you know, comported and conducting himself according to the word of, of course, you know. Even sinners don't fight during the church service, average sinners, normal sinners, community sinners, even sinners behave in a particular way in the house of God. But that's only for three hours. I about all the hours of the week you go back to your family and you go back to the place of work, and you go back to the marketplace, and you go back to your profession, if you are ungodly and a sinner, it says, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? He wants us to so conduct our lives. That's the exhortation. And he said, Titus, don't miss out this. Don't just speak about heaven. Tell them how we ought to behave here on earth in our places of work and give profitable exhortation to scriptural obedience in all things. Before we leave that part, scriptural obedience. If anything in the place of work will call you to contradict the word of God, disobey the word of God, and disobey the almighty God, you say no, that is the limit of scriptural obedience. We're looking in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 29. It says, but then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to be God rather than men. If employers demand anything contrary to the word of God, if husbands demand anything contrary to the word of God, if masters demand anything contrary to the word of God, if principals or teachers demand anything contrary to the word of God, there our obedience stops. We ought to be God rather than men. That scriptural obedience. Point number two there is proper execution of secular obligation in all things. In Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 10, not purloining. You understand that word? That word means, if you look at the dictionary, not pilfering. It means not stealing. Not purloining, not stealing. You see the people of those days, and even people in our day, they'll say, look at the pittance they're giving me for salary. Look at the allowance they are paying me for salary. Look at, you know, all I'm on my, you know, net or something. This is what I'm going home with. This cannot do anything. And because of that, they purloin. Because of that, they steal. Because of that, they peel for. Because of that, they might take, uh, you know, pens and uh, ball pens, uh, you know, out of the office, take back home. They might take papers, take back home. They might take uh, calendars, take back home. They might take uh, even money and take back home. It says we, as workers in a secular employment anywhere, not purloining. Well, even in the home, I've been asking my husband to give me this, and she wanted no money, no money. And then when the husband is not around, we'll search everywhere, draw a pocket everywhere, and take, you know, some chunk of money. I cannot be just living like this. I need all this money. What belongs to him belongs to me. Not purloining, not pilfering, not stealing. The same thing with the husband. You know, this woman has money, and I don't know what she's doing with the money. Actually, everything should be in my care. Not purloining. We must not allow anything. Money, covetousness, 
insincerity, duplicity to hinder or to soil our Christian pure garment. No stealing, no pilfering, no polluting, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. It tells us then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more. We're not born again. We're now children of God. Let him that stole steal no more. But let him labor honestly. Let him labor honestly. Let him labor profitably, walking with his sons, the sin which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Instead of, uh, you know, living on charity, give me something there, give me something there. And the people who are always giving, giving like that to an able-bodied man. Uh, and the people who are giving, I'm surprised, a uh, man giving something to the wife of another man. Uh, I know you need this. Why don't you give it to the husband? But they're giving it to the woman. It says all that should not be the life of a child of God. It should not be in the life of anyone that calls himself herself a leader in the church of the living God. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, labor honestly, labor profitably, and labor acceptably, working with his sons the sin that is good, that he may have to give to them that needeth. He doesn't expect us to steal and we will not steal. And there are people that say, yes, we will not steal. But you know, the scripture has a lot to say about stealing. And what we know generally is, I shouldn't steal money. That's true. I shouldn't steal property belonging to another person. That's true. Look at this. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 6. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 6. Here the word is saying, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, so as to Absalom stole, look at that, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He stole their hearts away from the king. They should have been loyal to the king. To King David. They should have been obedient to King David, but by all the methods he could use, Absalom stole their hearts, the hearts of the men of Israel, from David the king to himself. That's more serious than stealing money. Now you see, there are people that see good workers in another person's company. You see good employees in another person's company. Maybe they went to do some business there and they see how dutiful, how loyal, how competent those workers are. And then they have link interaction with them and they steal their commitment, their heart, their concentration away from that company and they steal that to themselves. They might promise them better salary. They might promise them better conditions of service. Stealing is stealing, and that is even worse than stealing money. And there are people that steal the hearts of members of the church away from the minister, away from the leader. So the leader is just laboring. The leader is just walking and walking and sweating, and then this other person will stay there, and he's stealing the hearts of the people, the confidence of the people, the trust of the people, away from the shepherd and the minister, stealing their hearts unto himself. You know that's wrong and God will judge that. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 30. 
It tells us in Jeremiah, he's talking about this area of stealing, stealing the word of God and stealing the confidence of the people and the total dependence of the people on the word of God. And instead of allowing this word to penetrate the hearts of the people, they're not doing that. We're looking at Jeremiah. Please open your Bible, Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 23, we're reading from verse 30. Here is what God himself told Jeremiah, that God was against, and God still is the same God. He says, I am God, I change not. He says, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets that says the Lord, that steal my words, everyone from me his neighbor. They have a dream to tell. They have an idea to give. They have an opinion to share. And in, all, in sharing those opinions, those ideas, and those dreams, they steal the confidence of the people away from the Word of God. They turn the eyes of the people away from the Word of God. Anything that anybody does, a preacher, an, an employee, a servant, a master, an overseer, a leader, anything that anyone does that will steal the word of God away from the hearts of the people is against the Lord, and God is against it. So it's not just that I don't steal because I don't steal money. Are you stealing the hearts of people away from their husbands, away from their wives? Are you stealing the hearts of people away from their leaders? Are you stealing the hearts of people away from the shepherds, the ministers that God has placed over them? God says, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, that steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. In Romans chapter 2, verse 21, here the Lord is asking us a question and is showing us that we need to examine our lives, examine our attitude, examine our action. Thou therefore we teach us another Teachest thou not thyself, thou that preachest that a man should not steal, should not steal money? Are you stealing the hearts of people? away from God and away from the leadership and you're turning their minds over to yourself you that preach that a man should not steal should not steal money are you stealing the hearts of daughters away from their parents thou does uh, that they should not say does thou steal the Lord wants us to conduct ourselves in the way we are to conduct ourselves so we don't become guilty of do as I say and not do as I do. We'll come to number three now, the purpose of all this. And the purpose of the revelation of the word of God to everyone, the purposeful exaltation of a soul ownership in all things. It tells us in Titus chapter 2 verse 10, the latter part of verse 10, it says that thou may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things, ask yourself, are you beautifying the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things? Are you exalting the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things? Are you adorning the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things? Are you pointing the attention of the people to the word of God in all things? Are you making the people to appreciate and to honor and to love and to be devoted to the word of God, the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things? That's the purpose of our lives. That's the purpose of the ministry. That's the purpose of our calling. That's the purpose of our consecration. That's the purpose of our service. That's the purpose of everything that will purposefully exalt God as the owner of our lives, 
as the owner of the world, as the owner of the ministry, as the owner of the members, as the owner of the whole ministry and the whole church. And therefore, we want to purposefully every time exalt the Lord, the sole owner, the only owner in everything, in all things. I pray that your life, my life, our lives will bring glory to God in everything and at all times. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost with all the faculties in your body? Don't you know that your body with all the faculties, with all the senses, with all the skills, with all the abilities, don't you know that you belong to the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? In verse 20 here is the conclusion. For ye are bought with a price. Ye are bought, purchased with a price. Therefore glorify God. Therefore exalt God. Therefore honor God. Therefore please God. Therefore glorify God in your body and with all your senses and with all your skills and with all your faculties and with all your abilities. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are Gods, they belong to God. It tells us in First Peter chapter four, verse eleven. First Peter chapter four, and we're looking at verse eleven. It's telling us that the end of all things is now at hand, and we need to glorify God. This is our calling. We need to honor God. This is our calling, and we need to beautify the doctrine of Christ. This is our calling. We need to adorn the gospel and the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. They should be our commitment, and they should be our devotion, and they should be a priority every moment, every minute, all the days of our lives. Anytime we have opportunity to minister to other people, we're not just thinking about ourselves or thinking about them, we're thinking about God. We need to glorify God, honor God, exalt God, adorn the doctrine of God, and we need to adorn the will of God in all things. It tells us in First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 11, if any man speak, if any man minister, if any man counsel, if any man preach, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability God giveth. As of the ability God giveth. Everything the Lord has given us, we need to relate to the people and we need to serve the people with everything. It says that God in all things, those are the three words again, in all things that God in all things may be glorified in your ministry, that God in all things may be glorified in your utterances, in your speech, that God in all things may be exalted in your ministry, in everything that you do, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Lord has uh, taught us today, we're looking at uh, Titus as we round up. In Titus uh, chapter 2, it's uh, revealed his mind to us uh, from verse 7. And he has told us that this is what he expects of false leaders, of false ministers, of false preachers, of false pastors. What he expects of false, of false uh, overseers in any area of the work he says in all things. Brother, sister, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, in doctrine, showing gravity, in doctrine, showing sincerity and faithfulness. And then in verse 8, it says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And now our ministry, our exhortation, our preaching, it says in verse 9, exhort servants, 
to be obedient. Don't excuse them. Never excuse disobedience from any servant or any employee. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well. Not please them grudgingly. Please them well in all things. Not answering again. In verse 10, it says, not purloining, not stealing, not pilfering not purloining but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn, exalt, beautify the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. In all things at the beginning, in all things at the end. May the Lord give us grace to be who and what has called us to be as ministers, as leaders, as overseers, as pastors, as fathers, as mothers, as members of the church of the living God. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray that God himself will help us so that all this that we have learned today, the revealed pattern for godly ministers, that God will help us to carry everything out brother pray sister pray without prayer there'll be no power without prayer grace will not increase without prayer the might of god will not be implanted indelibly on our hearts without prayer we might hear and then forget it is prayer that writes everything on the table of the heart. It is prayer that furnishes us the grace to be and to do everything it calls us to be and to do. It is prayer that gets the power. It is prayer that gets the heavenly influence in our lives so that we'll be able to carry out the word as we have been taught in the word. You are a minister like Titus, an overseer like Titus, a pastor like Titus. Be a pattern. Be a model. Be an example. An example in everything, in all things. In doctrine, in preaching, in lifestyle, in all the calling God has given. Be a pattern. In your family be a pattern if every family in the church were to be exactly like your family the, will the church be happy joyful peaceful fulfilled productive be a pattern then whatever you expect the members should be in their families as we have been taught in the word of God, be exactly that. A pattern as a preacher, a pattern as a counselor, a pattern as a devoted shepherd in the church of the living God. Examine all those things the Lord has revealed unto us. Let's examine our lives and make sure that we're sincere, we're honest, we're holy, we're godly, we're righteous, and then we'll have the stamina to exhort servants to be obedient to their masters in all things. We're not stealing, we're not pilfering, we're not purloining, and so we'll be able to exhort others to not to steal, not to pilfer, not to purloin. Faithfulness, good fidelity in all things, adorning the doctrine of God. Give us the grace as we're asking. Father, thank you for what we have learned today as leaders, as ministers, as pastors, as overseers over the flock of the Lord. 
We pray, Lord, you'll make us shining examples. You'll make us good pattern. And you'll make us real leaders that others can follow in Jesus' name. Give us, Lord, the heart to be obedient to your word and to correct anything and everything that needs correction in our lives, in our ministry, in our calling, and in our obligation in the house of the Lord to the people of God in Jesus' name. Grant us your enabling power. Grant us your enabling spirit. And grant us, Lord, the abundant grace to be all we need to be as models, as examples, and as patterns in the ministry, in the calling you have given us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you make us to move on better, higher than ever before in Jesus' name. Make us profitable to the ministry and profitable to the kingdom. We pray, Lord, that as we serve faithfully, we'll be fruitful as well. And your work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. So that when the trumpet shall sound, ourselves, ministers, and the members that we'll be ministering to, all of us will gather together at your feet in Jesus' name. Enable everyone, empower everyone, energize everyone to be what we ought to be. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Grant you the favor, the grace to remain fruitful in the kingdom of God.